this computer. <clears throat> okay, today we're going to talk about vectors and vaccines. This is the first lecture in the series of medical entomology, and this is kind of a basic overview lecture uh, that's going to briefly summarize kind of the main themes that you encounter in vector biology. And then after this lecture, we're going to go through and look at individual diseases and individual vectors uh, on an individual basis. So medical entomology, in a sense, this class is, let me draw this out, this class is medical, so medical veterinary entomology. That's a very, very, very broad um, kind of thing. It's a bit, many, many different topics to study. Most of this class is going to focus on vectors. So like insects that spread diseases, how they spread those diseases, how they pick them up, what those diseases are, and, and how they cause pathogenesis. And most of the focus is in, is in humans. So most of the focus is, is sort of on the medical side. I do want to spend this semester developing much more of the veterinary side because I'm getting more interested in that. So I am going to put some more effort into that. Um, but what I do want to say is medical entomology is much broader than sort of analysis of just vectors. Like, for instance, there are spiders that can bite you, right, that can cause all kinds of like medical issues, but we're not going to like focus we're not going to have, well, maybe we could have a cool lecture on spiders, but, but I haven't done a lecture on spiders or anything like that, but there's many different like types of reasons why insects could interact with humans in sort of a medical basis or interact with animals in a medical basis in terms of veterinary entomology. So for instance, there are mites that live in human skin called scabies. Um, I think we talk a little bit about that, but the, that's a case where there's a medically relevant, in, well, not an insect, but something that's closely related to an insect, a mite. I think they're chelicerates. And that's a case where they're not spreading really a disease to you, but they're sort of like infecting your body. So that's one type of sort of um, interaction. There's also like allergic reactions people get to insects. So for instance, in your house, there are dust mites. Lots of people, if, when they when they encounter the, the dust mite exocuticle, the cuticle on, on the outside of the mite might get might get in their system and cause like an allergic reaction. Um, there's parasitism, so there's like tapeworms and stuff like that. They wouldn't really be entomology because they're not um, they're not insects, but they're sort of arthropods in general. They're organisms that shed their shed their cuticle. Those are arthropods. So, it, it, although they're, no, I think they're nematodes. Um, but you can, essentially what I'm saying is there's much more broader things than just insects, okay? It's much more broader than just insects that spread diseases, but this class is gonna focus on insects that spread diseases. And one of the reasons we do this is because really just one of the largest problems that humanity has not yet solved is is how to deal with mosquitoes. So this is a really interesting figure that you'll see many, many, many times in the medical entomology world. And it's essentially telling you how many humans these animals kill So per year. So there's like 10 shark attacks per year. Bears kill about 10 people per year, probably mostly in like Wyoming and Alaska. Uh, elephants, a hundred, crocodiles, a thousand, dogs, so spreading rabies, 25,000 people a year, snakes, 50,000 people trying, usually men trying to like reach down and like grab the snake, get bit. <laughs> um, and humans, like humans killing other humans, about 475,000 die a year. And mosquitoes just sort of vastly outweigh all of the other animals. So in reality, mosquitoes are the most deadly animal on the planet. And they kill about 725,000 people every year because they're spreading diseases. And it's even worse because most of these people are little children. So most of these people are not um, what you would think of as like robust middle-aged people. They're mostly killing, killing children. So like malaria selectively kills um, children more often than, um, than adults. Usually adults can kind of get through it. So mosquitoes are just kind of like really, really bad. And it's still kind of a, a piece that we've never learned to deal with on the planet yet. We haven't really figured out an effective solution 
to the mosquito problem, although I'm working on that. <laughs> um, and diseases spread by insects and mosquitoes in particular are much, much worse than just the disease itself. So you can imagine, you think from sort of a selfish standpoint that, well, if I get this disease, it's very, very bad for me. And it's very, I get very, very sick and therefore I might die, therefore that's bad. But it's also much, much worse for society because if there's like a cycle, right? If a person gets sick, that person becomes ill, then that person is unable to work. They're unable to go to work. And so if there's a factory or if you're in like a third world country that's starting to try to like um, go through kind of like an industrial revolution, all of a sudden now they've lost a significant portion of the labor that could help to improve the economy of that country. So it's not just individuals getting sick, but also like there's third and fourth level effects of that individual getting sick. And when that person is unable to work and they're supposed to be providing for their family, right? Now they're no longer making money. They might not be putting food on the table. So it increases sort of like a poverty cycle, making things worse and worse and worse for the people that live in that country. So essentially, if you get sick, it's not just you that deals with that problem. It's the whole society that has to sort of pay a cost for that. Um, and this is just cycle just perpetuates itself and makes matters worse and worse and worse. And you can imagine, imagine if you were a person and, you, and your government had, say, invested in educating you for 20 years, you know, that's a significant investment. And then all of a sudden, if you get sick and die, that's a significant loss of investment. So diseases are very bad in a sense that they kill people. And yes, that's, that's, that's bad, but it's also even worse because it's a, it's a detriment to society. So we want to get to the point where we can heal and get rid of these diseases, these vector-borne diseases. And many of these diseases are, in fact, vector-borne diseases. Okay, so some terminology, terms. This is going to start off real basic here. A vector, okay, that's any agent that carries and transmits an infectious pathogen. So it's something that's carrying a pathogen. So a needle could be a vector, okay? A mosquito could be a vector. It's a noun, um, and it makes people upset when you use it as a verb. So you shouldn't use, you shouldn't say mosquitoes vector malaria. People get mad about that. Uh, I don't really care, but, but medical entomologists sometimes are very strange people, uh, and they don't like that. So you have to use the word transmit, okay? Vectors are the nouns, they carry pathogens and they can transmit those pathogens. So don't use vector as a verb. Um, a pathogen, right? And people get these confused all the time, disease and pathogen. A pathogen is the actual agent that causes the disease. So we're gonna talk a lot about bacterial pathogens, viral pathogens, other microorganisms that cause disease. And disease is actually like the phenotype of somebody getting sick. It's what you see, it's the disease pathogenesis. It's in theory like a disorder of a structure or an organ or function in a human or an animal that should be normal and now something has been altered. That, that is what you could call the disease and the pathogens cause the disease. So then obviously vector-borne disease, a vector-borne disease is a disease that's spread by vectors, okay? Um, and it's worse because many of these vectors fly. So like with coronavirus now, we're kind of worried about human to human contact, you cough and somebody might, might get it. Um, in vector-borne diseases, it's, it's, in many ways it's worse because the pathogen is carried by an actual like homing mechanism that flies and it can smell you and it finds you and it bites you. Um, so it's, it's, it can be worse in some cases. And so many of the epidemic diseases like malaria, are vector-borne diseases. And they, can, they have a pattern in a sense that they can explode and all of a sudden become very bad outbreaks. So vector biology is then the study of vectors, whoa, uh, and the implications and epidemiological ways to control these. That's vector biology. And that's kind of what I focus on 
um, in the lab. But again, this is a very, very broad term, anything sort of related to diseases that are spread by vectors. So here's the last sentence down here. This is how you remember all this. And it sums it up. Vectors transmit pathogens and pathogens cause disease. Now the final point is important. This class is about vectors, but not all insects are vectors, okay? And not all vectors are insects. So just keep that in mind and I'll give an example of that. So here are some common vectors that we will discuss in the class today. Mosquitoes, and mosquitoes are actually classified as flies. So the order Diptera means two wings. These are creatures that have two wings and they're considered flies. Many, many, many flies spread diseases, okay? And mosquitoes are obviously spreading viruses like dengue virus, Zika virus, yellow fever virus, um, and then also spread, spreading microbial organisms like malaria, which is plasmodium. Um, what else do mosquitoes spread? Filariasis, which are nematodes um, that get in your body and cause nasty disease. We'll talk about that as well. Fleas, um, order Siphonaptera. Okay, these are, you have, if you're a veterinary, you for sure have seen these cat fleas, dog fleas, uh, and the bubonic plague was spread by, I think it's rat fleas, and it was actually also spread by body lice. We'll talk about that in the plague lectures. Lice, okay, lice are famous for um, spreading, uh, what's it called, typhus, epidemic typhus. And epidemic typhus has had like global impacts on the world where like when Napoleon was like invading Russia, there's a famous example of, I, I don't know the numbers exactly. It's in the, again, it's in the lice lecture, but he leaves for Russia with like 700,000 soldiers and, the famous case is that like 95% of those soldiers all die from epidemic typhus. So uh, these have had impacts on history and impacts on the way that the world is structured as we know it. Ticks, okay, ticks are not actually insects. They're in the order Acheri and they're more closely related to their chelicerates. So they, they're cl more closely related to spiders. Um, and then mites also spread diseases and mites and ticks are in the same sort of family. And mites and ticks spread things like Lyme's disease, um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, all these which we will talk about. Viruses are spread by ticks. Um, and then there's bugs, kissing bugs, which we will talk about order Hemiptera. These bugs spread Chagas disease, which are trypanosomes. So each of these will kind of get their own lecture and multiple lectures in some cases because some of these spread many, many, many things. And so over the course of the semester, we will discuss um, many of these aspects. But like I said in the last slide, not all vectors are insects. So do you guys know of any vectors that are vectors but are not insects? Can't think of any right now. Um, one that's very common is snails. So there are freshwater snails and they spread schistosomiasis. Um, so there's essentially the point of this slide is that just because you're an insect doesn't mean you're a vector and just because you're a vector doesn't mean you're an insect. Vector biology is sort of broader than insects. But for the most part, the focus of this class is insects because insects are particularly good at spreading diseases. Okay, now this slide is kind of ugly and complicated um, and I hate talking about this slide, but it's a good point. And there's a question of, are there any sort of evolutionary patterns or consistent patterns that correlate with being a vector? And the answer is kind of no and yes, okay? So if you were to look at the tree of all insects, um, being a vector of any disease in particular is a homoplastic trait. That means it looks like this. That means this trait evolves independently multiple times. So 
insects, well, essentially what this says in sort of really bad evolutionary lingo is insects can learn to become a vector through evolutionary biology. It's kind of what this says. Whereas uh, the contrasting example would be a synapomorphy, which is like holometaboly, where holometaboly is the trait in insects where they go through a larval stage, a pupil stage, and a adult stage. That's classic metamorphosis when you hear of like a butterfly um, going, or a, a, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. That's called holometaboly. That evolved one time. It evolved once. And all the insects that descend from this tree are all holometabolous. So what I'm saying is being a vector is not like that. Being a vector evolves multiple times all over the tree of life. And the ones that I've highlighted here are vectors. And here you can see that they kind of pop up all over. So it's not like being a vector evolved once, it's evolved multiple times. Okay, and this is just worth going over because um, maybe people have not had basic entomology. Again, hold a metaboly. What I mean by that is, and, and this is gonna be a common, one of these two is gonna be common in the life cycles of the organisms that we talk about. So I feel compelled that I must talk about this in the first lecture in medical entomology. Holometaboly is you start with an egg, okay? Drosophila, good example of this. You become a larvae. The larvae kind of crawl around and eat uh, and they look like cute little right, moving rice things. <laughs> Lauren does not like them. Uh, and then they pupate, and while they pupate, um, they go through vast structural morphological changes, and then they emerge as an adult that can fly. That's holometaboly. Uh, hemimetaboly is essentially, they come out of the egg looking like tiny adults, and then they're called nymphs, and they just molt and become progressively bigger and bigger and bigger, in theory, what are adults. Okay, so these are two different life cycle, uh, two different sort of life strategies for insects, and you kind of want to know what these are because we're going to be talking about holometabolous and hemimetabolous insects. Um, I think I gave you your, like a, the fancy taxonomic term for holometaboly, but you don't have to know that because if I don't remember it after two years, it's probably <laughs> pointless. Okay. Yeah, this is what I was saying, whole, uh, hemimetaboly. Grasshopper is a good example of this. They come out of the egg, they look like mini grasshoppers, and then they become medium-sized grasshoppers, and then they become adult-sized grasshoppers, which are called the imago or the adult stage. And these intermediate stages are usually called nymphs. And the different stages of the larvae are called instars. You will hear these, these terms quite, quite often. Yes. What, they have instars. Yeah. I shouldn't. I should not just say automatically say yes because I know nothing about thrips. Uh, but I'm assuming you're correct. Alex Xavier. Yeah. Um. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait a minute. What, you said humans yeah. are me hemi metabolic. Yeah, yeah, Human. Kind of oh, I see. Hemi, kind of hemi metabolic. I see what you're saying. Well, okay. That's actually that's actually an interesting question. Let me let me talk about that. Um. So. Are humans hemimetabolous? The real answer is no. And the answer is no because these are actually distinct what are called molts. So the reason that an insect has to shed its exoskeleton is because it, the exoskeleton is like wearing a hard shell. And as soon as you grow to your maximum point, you cannot grow bigger than that. So you have to shed your, extra, your exoskeleton to grow to a larger size if that makes sense. And so in, in insects, there are distinct quant, what you could call quanta, which are quant, uh, like, not quantum, but they're, they're distinct integer-like intervals where here's one nymph, it becomes the second nymph, and then you become the adult. Whereas humans are sort of a continuous spectrum of growth. We start growing, we might look relatively similar to what we look like as adults, but it's a continuous, it's a continuous grow, growth. There aren't distinct molds. So that's a good, actually, that's a good example um, to kind of talk about. Okay. So when I said if the answer, the answer is other patterns, and I said kind of like no 
and but yes kind of there's no sort of evolutionary patterns but there are patterns and there are some of the consistent themes that you see in diseases that are spread by by vectors and with respect to those vectors in particular is they suck blood so hematophagy right all the ticks the fleas the fly, uh many of the black flies the tsetse flies the mosquitoes they're all sucking blood, okay? And the re that's the reason they spread diseases is because they're literally um, kind of a bad analogy is like a dirty needle, but we'll talk about why that's kind of a bad analogy. But that's a pattern you see in vector biology is they, they do, they suck blood. Or, and we should be careful here because you can be a vector of not necessarily just a disease for humans, but a disease for plants. Okay. And this, it's kind of the same pattern where the, the, the insects that spread diseases plant to plant to plant are the insects that suck the phloem and the xylem, the, the sort of like the blood of the plants. Okay. So the theme is that many of these organisms go in and suck sort of like the inter fluids of other creatures. And that's how they spread diseases. And you also see consistent patterns in the structural evolution of their mouth parts. So you start to see patterns where mouth parts look the same. And the reason the mouth parts evolve to look the same is because they all have to serve the function of either piercing the skin or lacerating the skin to, to generate pools of blood or inserting like a needle into the skin. So you see many, many sort of consistent patterns in the evolution of mouth parts. And I think that's the next lecture is a whole lecture just on mouth parts, which is kind of fun. Okay, more terminology. You see this term all the time in discussions of vector biology, which is a zoonosis, zoonosis. And this is a disease that can be transmitted to humans from animals. Okay, that's in general a zoonosis. So the examples of this are rabies, Ebola, swine flu, West Nile virus, Lyme's disease. Okay, so a zoonosis is not, what do I want to say, is, I would want to say it's not necessarily a vector-borne disease because um, Ebola is not being spread by insects for sure. It's being spread in contact of fluids, like usually in like medical offices where nurses work and things like that. So that's, Ebola is not a vector-borne disease, but it nevertheless is a zoonosis. So these are different. So zoonosis does not equal vector-borne disease, okay? But it's still very common that many of the vector-borne diseases are zoonoses. And this relates to how vectors are spreading diseases. And it relates to this concept of a reservoir. So this is another term you will hear very, very often in vector biology. And this is a term where many cases there's an animal and inside that animal is a pathogen. So the pathogen actually lives inside of a particular animal. And so it's kind of like this sink where all that pathogen is stored in an endemic area. And then what happens is a vector like a mosquito comes and sucks the blood and gets that pathogen into it when it takes a blood meal. And then it goes and it takes a second blood meal after that and spreads the disease. Yes, the question? Yeah. Um, what are these people doing? What are these people doing? Um, this one looks pregnant and upset. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, they're upset because they're getting diseases. <laughs> Human, like human giving it to like a animal? I have no idea. You should Google that. Somebody Google that quick. Um, I don't know. Okay, so quick question. Is malaria, is malaria a zoonosis? It's not a zoonosis. And that's because most of the malaria parasites actually float around in humans. So the human is the reservoir 
and the mosquito bites a human, picks it up, and then bites another human. So in that sense, it's not a zoonosis because usually malaria is not spread animal to human, it's spread person to person. So that's an important distinction, although there are caveats to that, like there are like monkey and bird malarias and like you could get those. Um, but typically those are not actually the real bad ones. The real bad ones are human to human. Um, couple more comments about this, about the, the reservoirs, okay? The reservoirs often do not get sick. So oftentimes, like the, if a monkey in the jungle has Ebola, well, maybe Ebola is a bad example. Uh, if, but like, there are many times where like a cow might have a disease and you might see no phenotype whatsoever. You might see no disease pathology in the cow. And that's because the cow has evolved for many, many, many years to be in association with that pathogen. And what happens over time as pathogens evolve, they go through this process, which is called attenuation, which is the pathogen does not actually want to kill its host, right? If it kills its host, it's done. It's like you just destroyed the car that you were driving in, right? The pathogen just kind of wants to like sit in the back seat and not destroy the car. Okay, so pathogens evolve and are selected to become attenuated to not kill the host. And so oftentimes the zoonoses are particularly bad because what's happening is the pathogen is all of a sudden transferring from the host that it's comfortable in to a host that it's completely uncomfortable in. It doesn't know how to regulate itself. And, it, and you, that's how you get these advanced sort of pathologies that end up killing the humans. So this is a very, very common thing that you see. Yes. Well, most of those bacteria, right, have evolved sort of like they, they kind of know um, how to not replicate so much that they're causing problems. Like they, they've kind of like toned it down a little bit and that's through evolution. Okay, so another question. Is the bed bug a vector of anything? So bed bug, it has piercing sucking mouth parts, it drinks human blood, is it a vector? Is it? What diseases are spread by bed bugs? Is it a vector? Vector means it spreads a pathogen. Now again, like there's there's like ran there's like well there's like random papers that say like well the bed bug spread this disease this one time when we like measured it in this strange way, um, but for the most part bed bugs like don't they don't spread disease, but the question is why like they have all the patterns. I was gonna say they have like the same composition because I remember drawing this they have the same um in they have the same look as the lice only they differ in like mouth parts. Well, their mouth parts look like this. They're essentially like sharp needles. Yeah. And lice mouth parts are essentially like chewing. Lice like chew. Um, so their mouth parts are definitely different. But, but it's, it's an interesting question because they suck blood and their mouth parts look like mosquito mouth parts. And mosquitoes spread diseases. So why don't bed bugs spread disease? Okay. And the answer to this is complicated. And also it relates to another question people ask me all the time. Why don't mosquitoes spread coronavirus? Why don't mosquitoes spread AIDS? Why? Do you guys have any thoughts? Yeah, exactly. You guys are both kind of right. So there's a term called vector competence. And that's actually like the next slide. Good. Uh, vector competence. Okay, and vector competence is the idea that not all insects actually have the ability to acquire a pathogen, maintain it, and transmit it. Okay, you might be able to could take it up into your gut, but excuse me, let's think about like what happens here. So if a mosquito, if a mosquito bites a human and it takes a blood meal, okay, so here's its gut takes a blood meal, and in the blood, let's say there are malaria parasites, okay? 
Now, what's going to happen to that blood? Yeah, it's going to digest it. It's going to eat it. Okay, it's going to digest it. And then eventually, maybe it'll just like crap it out. Um, so most of the vast majority of what you might call pathogens that a mosquito is picking up are literally just being eaten by the mosquito or crapped out in the, in the end, okay? But some, a very, very few, okay? And I wanna, really wanna emphasize few, a very, very few amount of pathogens have evolved the ability, okay? To replicate in the gut. That means they actually can divide in the gut. And then they do what's called invasion, okay? So they invade, they push out past the gut and the mosquitoes and all insects have their own sort of blood system called the hemolymph. And they can get into that blood system and they circulate around in the insect. And in the head of many, many insects is what we call the salivary glands. So these look, these look, I don't know maybe something like this. These are not the eyes. These are the salivary glands. If the, if the parasite can infect the salivary glands, now what's happened? Now when the mosquito bites you and it gives you a little bit of spit to promote your blood, from, to, to promote your blood flow, now it's spitting the pathogen into you. Okay. So, but this only happens, this only happens when in the cases that the parasite or the pathogen can actually replicate and find its way to like the salivary glands, okay? And it's not very common that this can be done. So this is why, for instance, mosquitoes don't spread AIDS, whereas they would certainly bite humans that have AIDS and they would certainly probably pick up the HIV virus into their gut, but the HIV virus is not gonna replicate inside of the mosquito and it's not gonna get into the salivary glands because what uh, Lewis said is the receptors are different. It's gonna be looking for receptors to grab onto, to get into cells and invade. It's not gonna have evolved the capability to replicate in the mosquito, okay? So this is a very, very important concept in vector biology is just because you have a pathogen in your gut doesn't mean you are a vector. And some insects are particularly uh, good in a sense at being a vector, and then they would have high vector competence. Whereas the bed bug has extremely low vector competence. Most of the pathogens, human pathogens that it picks up, they can't, they can't move into its salivary glands, they can't spread it. Now the other important thing that this means is in order for an insect to spread a disease, it has to bite twice. So this is another very, very common theme in vector biology is there's usually a first bite where an insect will pick up the disease and then there's so one pick up the disease and then there's usually a second bite much later where it will spread the disease and the timing here is important okay the timing here some viruses and here's an example in mosquitoes some viruses need like at least greater than or equal to two weeks for them from the first time at which they are picked up to get out into the mosquito and get into the salivary glands. So if the insect um, bites somebody less than two weeks later, it's not gonna spread the disease, even though it has it, okay? And there's actually terms for these time intervals. They're called incubation periods. So the extrinsic incubation period is the time that it takes for the virus to become, or the pathogen to become spreadable in the bug or in the vector. And the intrinsic incubation period is the time it takes for the reservoir to essentially be able to donate the pathogen, okay? Because just because a mosquito spits some malaria into you doesn't mean that you're immediately able to spread that malaria to somebody else through an insect bite. There are these extrinsic and intrinsic incubation periods um, in vector biology. Okay, 
And this then, now you can start to understand the connection to why you might study vector biology, right? Because if you understand the life cycle of the mosquito, and you know that that's actually about how long it takes, um, is, well, well, usually, I'm trying to think, a mosquito will take a blood meal, and usually it will digest it by about 48 hours, and then it will be ready to lay eggs about on that third day. And then it's gonna lay those eggs and then it's gonna start looking for a blood meal, okay? But if the mosquito lives very long, if the mosquito's life is greater than or equal to two weeks and it gets that first blood meal right away, you can see how you're gonna have a big population of dangerous mosquitoes two weeks later, okay? Whereas some insects might be low vector competence because maybe they, maybe they die real fast. Maybe they take a blood meal and they just die quicker than it takes for that virus or that pathogen to become um, spreadable. Okay, so let's also talk about some factors that influence vector competence. I have seven minutes left. Okay, so factors that influence vector competence. It could be, it could be molecular. It could be a molecular factor. It could be, where's my thing? It could be structural and it could be behavioral. Behavioral, there might be others. What would that mean? What would, it, what would a molecular factor that would influence vector competence be? What's an example of that? That's correct, give an example. Like what gene? Like well, just like an example, like what gene might be important for this? A fly is not going to have antibiotic resistance, I don't think. Lewis had a good answer earlier, probably like a receptor. Yeah, so like a common theme is if you are a pathogen and you are trying to get inside of a cell and invade that cell, you have to know what you're touching. Like pathogens are kind of like blind things that just kind of like feel around. And they feel around through their skin, which is sort of their outer surface proteins. And they might have a particular outer membrane protein, which particularly is quite good at recognizing a particular receptor. And then once that happens, it's kind of like a lock and a key. Oh, you found an entrance. And then now it can get in and then now it can replicate. So molecular vector competence might be like a receptor. Whereas like in a mosquito, maybe the receptors match because they look like that semicircle. Whereas in a bed bug, maybe those same receptors don't match because they look like, like this and the circle can't like bind to that. Does that make sense? That would be like an example of a molecular factor influencing vector competence. What about behavioral? Mm -hmm. That would be more, that'd probably be more molecular. Behavioral would be like. Yes, that's a very good example. So for instance, if the reservoir is uh, nocturnal, it's only running around at night and the vector is only outside at three o'clock in the afternoon when it's hot, you're not gonna get spreading of a disease. Even though it might actually be like a capable vector, it's still not gonna spread the disease. So that would relate to vector competence. The other one that's also very common, hang on one sec. The other one that's very common with mosquitoes is taste. Like they have, a pr every species of mosquito has a preference of animal that it likes to bite. So if you have a mosquito that doesn't like to bite birds, it's not gonna spread West Nile virus because the reservoir of West Nile virus is birds. So you have to have a mosquito like Helix pipians, which both likes bird blood and also is okay with human blood. That's when you get these situations where you have a transmission of a vector-borne disease. Um, what was your question? Um, theoretically, if the mosquito doesn't need to eat Example, say the incubation period is like three days and then the mosquito ends up killing off the virus inside of, inside of it. So if it takes like a long time to eat, then 
if he picks up a virus, the virus is not dying before he has to eat the human. If certainly, if the virus dies while it's inside of the bug, it will not be able to spread it. Theoretically, theoretically. Yes. Um, okay, let's quick. Let's see if we can define these quick before we finish. Um, these are other common terms you're going to see in vector biology. What's vertical transmission? Mom. Mom to sons and daughters. So mom to child. What's transstadial transmission? So that means the, the pathogen passes from mom to child. Transstadial? That relates to the holometaboly, hemimetaboly. That means does it go from like nymph to nymph? Does it go from the pupil stage to the adult stage? And some pathogens don't because there's a gigantic rearrangement of the cellular structure that happens during the pupil stage. And some pathogens cannot survive that. So some pathogens are not transmitted transstadially, which means like, does it go from stage to stage of the life cycle? Horizontal transmission? Species to species. So in this case, the example is like this, what is this chipmunk to like a, a mosquito to like a human? That would be horizontal. Um, just quick, pathogens have these very complicated life cycles. We'll talk about these when we get to the specific diseases. I just show this because I want you to kind of see like, like this is kind of like what you see is there's these complicated life cycles in vector biology. And some of this is important. Some of it, you can learn it when you need it. Um, endemic. So what makes a disease endemic? Yeah, so, so what it means to be endemic is, this is being strange, what it means to be endemic is it's in a particular region and it's like, <clears throat> it's in that region like a lot. And there's some factors that contribute to whether something is endemic or whether it's not, right? You have to have a good reservoir in the area. You have to have a good vector in the area the behavior of the reservoir and the vector has to overlap. So there has to be like an interaction. Um, and you have to have the pathogen. So for instance, um, here's, the, here's the endemicity of Lyme's disease. This is where you find Lyme's disease in the United States. Now we have deer, we have Ixodes ticks, and we do have Lyme's disease around here. Why don't we have it? Why doesn't it look like, why doesn't it look like that in Alabama? We don't have a good reservoir. So in the north, they have a different species of mice. And in the mice, the Borrelia can replicate and get to real high titers. Whereas in the south, we don't have that particular species of mouse, which there, which is the main reservoir. In Fatal? Uh, usually Lyme disease is not killing people. Usually it's just making their life a living hell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've had it. So uh, I'll, we'll talk about that when Lyme disease lecture comes up. Um, let me quick here see. Okay, this is a good stopping point. Let's stop here and um, we will continue next lectures. Any questions? All right, good first day. Thank you. <laughs>